This is Fresh Ed. I'm Will Brem. My guest today, educational researcher Dr. Frank Adamson, gives us a look at his new book, Global Educational Reform, How Privatization and Public Investment Influence Education Outcomes, which he co-edited with Bjorn Estrand and Linda Darling-Hammond. Frank is a senior policy and research analyst at the Stanford Center for Opportunity Policy in Education. His new book, due out in March of 2016, offers a comparative look at the education policies and outcomes in six countries, Chile, Cuba, Sweden, Finland, Canada, and the United States. Frank and his co-editors selected these countries because collectively they span a range of education policy approaches, from neoliberal approaches that emphasize school vouchers to social democratic approaches that emphasize government's responsibility for education. Dr. Frank Adminson, welcome to Fresh Ed. Uh, hi, Will. Thanks for having me on the show. Um, you've recently, or you will be publishing, a co-edited volume called Global Educational Reform, How Privatization and Public Investment Influence Educational or Education Outcomes. Um, how did you get involved in the subject of educational privatization? So I initially wrote my dissertation on the relationship between income inequality and a variety of different education measures, student achievement, teacher preparation, opportunities to learn. And so I was already focused on the uh, economic aspects of education, and that continued when I was looking at resource distribution issues um, for teacher salaries in New York and California uh, in the United States. And... So uh, my uh, body of research is always focused on the relationship between education, finance, and governance. And uh, in about 2011, I uh, ran across Ian McPherson at Open Society Foundation that they had just established the Privatization Education Research Initiative, which is looking at this newish phenomena of privatization in education, um, which is... oh a new way to think about um, economic contributions and the role of economics and funding in the education sector. Right. So it sounds like you have um, quite a long history studying uh, economics of education and educational privatization and and specifically the uh, inequalities that may come out. Um, And I know you work at the Stanford Center uh, for Opportunity Policy and Education, uh, scope at Stanford University, and you co-edit this uh, volume with uh, Bjorn Estrand and Linda Darling-Hammond. How did the three of you uh, come together uh, to work on this project? Yeah, well, um, I was originally working with Linda at Scope uh, following my uh, PhD at Stanford, and uh, we were looking at um, kind of how uh, Different, different countries were organizing their accountability systems uh, with respect to testing and with respect to teacher preparation. And um, I had an idea in mind uh, for an article that sort of evolved into this book, and the title of that article would have been The Future of U.S. Education, Finland or Chile. And the idea was that the United States falls kind of in, at this choice point between a Finnish public investment model and the Chilean privatization model. Well, Bjorn happened uh, to be uh, a fellow at Stanford at this time, and he met with Linda and told Linda about the privatization strategies that were now occurring in Sweden that most of us weren't actually aware of. So then we decided to expand the book and use a, a country dyad model or pairs of countries that are geographically similar but using different strategies. So we have uh, Sweden and Finland is a one-country pair, the United States and Canada, and then Cuba and Chile. Very interesting. Um, that You were kind enough to share with me your introductory chapter uh, for this forthcoming uh, volume. And in it, you begin uh, by speaking of the recent protests in Chile, and you use it as a way to uh, distill the historical trajectory um, and development of economic thinking and education policy making. Um, and I found it interesting that you, you distinguish between 
what you call neoliberalism 1.0 and neoliberalism 2.0. Um, can you explain what these terms mean to our audience, um, and specifically in relation to, to Chile, which seemed to be one of the first case studies that you uh, wanted to look at for this, this book idea of yours? Sure. Uh, and I, I think uh, for me, in, in writing this introductory chapter and, and really looking back at the roots of the economic thought that has developed over the, the last century, it was very interesting to um, first look back at sort of the root of neoliberalism and break down that word, neoliberalism. And so it was really a turn to liberalism, which... Um, was advocated by Friedrich von Hayek uh, as a veteran of World War I. And so, you know, Hayek was, I think, actually in World War I, and he had a lot of suspicions about governments uh, having too much power politically and militarily. And he, he was convinced that, that markets were the way to go, that um, market liberalism, so freeing up the markets for trade, was going to be the the route out of centralized economy, socialism, fascism, and the root causes for uh, World War One. Well, if we fast forward forty years, I mean, and actually we don't need to fast forward. We can just say that um, at the same time in the thirties there was the Great Depression, and um, uh, John Maynard Keynes had a new idea, uh, which became known as Keynesian economics, which is really about um, having the state invest in uh, its population. And uh, the New Deal was the iteration of that in the United States, and it really was quite successful. Uh, nevertheless, the kind of neoliberal ideal went underground uh, for the, you know, then following 30, 40 years. And Milton Friedman picked it up at the University of Chicago, and he did what I would call neoliberalism 2.0, which is much more of a focus on privatization. So the first neoliberalism 1.0 was about liberalization, opening up to markets. But then Friedman's idea was that you have private actors, um, and particularly within education, you have a voucher system where a parent receives money and they can give it to any person, public or private, that would uh, provide education for their student. And it's rooted in this idea that the efficiency of the market is what's going to uh, provide the highest quality of education. Um, so then Friedman's ideas were exported uh, into Chile, um, and they were imported by uh, Augusto Pinochet, who was the dictator in Chile who overthrew a democratically erected president. Um, and he instituted this neoliberal ideal, um, sort of the global neoliberal test case. Um, and in the next 40 years, Chile instituted this voucher scheme across the whole country. So to return to your question about what happened in Chile, you know, the evolution of the 1.0, the 2.0, of privatization ended up with um, increased stratification in these countries, I mean, in Chile in particular, and the increased stratification of students. And by, what I mean by that is basically there are different tiers of students so that each um, class of parent can provide one or uh, a little bit more money for their student to go to a slightly better school. And... Mm -hmm. um, what happens is uh, then a lot of people are left with access to lower quality education. And that got so bad that literally hundreds of thousands of Chileans ended up creating a social movement in the streets in 2006 and most recently in 2011. So that's where we really tee off the book is saying in 2011, hundreds of thousands of people were in the streets. Why is this happening? Right, and and you have this incredible image of Milton Friedman and uh, Pinochet meeting um, in your introductory chapter. And I, one of the questions that I have, and maybe this is beyond your work, is is why did Pinochet want to embrace these neoliberal ideas that Milton Friedman was 
popularizing or at least writing about at the University of Chicago? Well, I, I think that's a great question. I think that's a, a <laughs> geopolitical question, right. honestly. Um, <laughs> I think it, it, it has to do with U.S. involvement in Chile, um, both militarily at first because the CIA was involved in the coup. They, um, they basically aided Pinochet in becoming um, the, the, the military leader, the dictator of the country, and then there was a, a kind of a thought exchange as many Chilean scholars were at um, the University of Chicago studying under Friedman. And I think it's also important, though, to note that this wasn't like a straight import of neoliberalism 2.0. It's not a download of uh, an update to your iPhone. This was an evolving process over time, and I'm kind of using it, it's more of an era description to say that this is how it evolved in terms of the voucher scheme. So Friedman had these ideas, and he thought that, you know, rightly so, that in a dictatorship you could more easily implement your economic ideas than in a democracy. Ironically enough, Friedman thought that this would lead to more democratic uh, decision-making because uh, he thought that the market would, you know, have this catch-all effect on the overall nation. And as we see militarily, that didn't happen. Right. And uh, to get back to the the focus on education, you talk about how this neoliberalism as a as an era, um, the the forty years since Friedman, um, produces something, or it creates these economic rationales uh, that are found within education. And you call this the the global education reform movement, and it's made up of um, certain policy drivers and certain economic rationales, and, and then it ultimately results in, in particular uh, education mechanisms. Can you de- describe what you mean by global education reform movement or what you term the germ? Sure. So uh, one of the authors in our volume, uh, the author of the Finnish chapter, and, and I should say briefly that we've had authors from each uh, of the countries that we study uh, write the country chapters, with the exception of uh, Martin Carnoy, Stanford wrote the Cuba chapter, and he's done extensive work in Cuba. Um, and so they have a, uh, a special knowledge about their, their countries and their context that uh, is irreplicable by, a, by an outsider. And so when you look at, he's talked about what he terms the global education reform movement or the germ. And it's m- sort of an evolving set of policies. It's not really a, an official stance. It's more of an unofficial set of approaches to, uh, to education. And we, we were sitting down trying to really think about how it functions at many different levels. And what we came up with was, as you talked about, you know, you have um, the, the germ is functioning at, at a policy level, um, And so those would be policy drivers such as privatization, deregulation, decentralization, liberalization. That's what's kind of um, driving the direction of uh, national and and, uh, local policy. And then you have sort of the economic rationales that are underpinning those policy drivers. That's things like efficiency, like I talked about, that if the market's working more efficiently uh, through privatization, then it's going to more effectively produce uh, education outcomes. Uh, You have choice. Uh, Scarce resources are often used as a a rationale for uh, changing to a more efficient system. And you can see that these rationales are also sort of nested within each other. And then um, you have the mechanisms, right? So how does this happen in the classroom? Um, The mechanisms from a germ perspective uh, a neoliberal perspective would be vouchers, uh, as we saw in Chile. Charter schools are a, a big growing uh, industry or sector of the, the education uh, sector in the United States. Uh, markets are happening in education in Sweden. Um, so these mechanisms are how the, and, um, the rationales of efficiency and choice are enacted uh, in a particular context. Right, and and you um, you kind of provide a counterexample of 
of movements towards the global education reform movement uh, with something you call the public investment approach in education. What is this approach, and um, how does it differ with the germ that you've just outlined? Sure. So I should you know, just say that um, before I mentioned the, the dyads of countries, and so the whole premise of the book is um, kind of comparing countries that are pursuing different approaches. So Sweden has privatized in the last 20 years, whereas Finland is, has a strong public investment model for about the last 40 years. The United States is pursuing, in some areas, a path towards privatization, whereas in Canada we focus on the case study of Ontario because it's a federalist country and it doesn't actually have a lot of uh, federal oversight over education in the different provinces. So we focus on Ontario, which has pursued a more public investment strategy recently. And then we have Chile, which, as I already described, is more neoliberal, and Cuba, which has also done a public investment strategy. So within that public investment strategy, we turn to the policy drivers, and we find things like public ownership, public responsibility, democratic decision-making, not in Cuba, but in the other countries. Um, and there's a really a focus on um, if the, the government is the, the, elect, if the elected officials are the ones responsible for providing and securing high-quality education for students, then there's some sort of uh, accountability mechanism upwards accountability mechanism uh, for parents, for educators, to know that they need to be supported in their classrooms. Whereas in a lot of the privatization strategies that we see, there's very little uh, accountability for the organizations or companies that are providing the uh, education because they're, they don't have democratically elected boards. They're usually privately appointed it functions in a lot of different ways, but the main idea is that with deregulation, deregulation and decentralization comes a decrease in uh, public accountability, public responsibility. So then looking at um, the economic rationales, so I think, again, we turn, they're very focused on um, sort of the, the public good of education, so universal access, preparing citizens for economy and democracy, and of course, equity. And equity, by the way, is a contested term. Both privatizers and public investment models uh, claim equity, and I think it's really important to look at the outcomes to uh, understand whether or not that's actually occurring. And finally, the mechanisms <laughs> for um, public education, uh, I mean, public investment models would be well-prepared teachers equitable funding of schools across the country or the jurisdiction, having a high-quality infrastructure, and having a whole child pedagogy and curriculum. So there you're focusing on all of the elements of um, preparing a, a teacher for delivering a high-quality education and giving them the right model and context to do that. Whereas if you're focused more on a profit or on how markets are working, the primary focus isn't on the public investment in the germ model. And so you say that the the term or the idea of equity is, is contested between both the, the germ and the public investment approach. Um, and you, you say that you need to look at the outcome. So having edited this volume with these different groupings of, of countries, um, what did you learn about the outcomes in terms of equity? The outcome story is quite interesting. Uh, we, we talk about it in the concluding chapter. And uh, you, when you look at the, you know, test scores are both helpful because they're a sort of single number or a set of numbers that you can look at to give you a broad picture of what's going on in countries, and that's what we've done here. So we, when you look at PISA scores, Finland actually scored uh, very high and has consistently scored high. Sweden, uh, over the time that it's uh, installed a, 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 a privatization market-based model, uh, their scores have actually dropped below the OECD mean. Um, Canada's scores have remained high, while the U.S. scores have remained below the OECD mean. And um, when you look at Latin America, Cuba doesn't participate in the PISA, but they um, participate in the CERCE and the TERCE test with Chile, and Cuba is literally off the charts in terms of Latin American education. 
So there are outcomes um, that are generally accepted at the global level that show that the public investment models in these countries are preparing their students at um, generally higher levels. And then when you look at the distribution bands of that performance, you find um, sh smaller bands in the countries that are pursuing public investment models. The United States has one of the largest uh, performance bands, so I'm talking about differences between high and low performance of almost a standard deviation uh, in the United States, and it's a well-known term in the United States, the achievement gap. One of the economic rationales in the public investment approach that you propose is, is universal access. Um, but there is this rhetoric um, or argument within some of the literature on low-fee private schools by, by people like James Tooley, for instance, um, that actually says in countries and in places where the government is unable to provide education to its citizens, a low-fee private school approach actually helps achieve universal access. Um, how does that argument complicate your idea, uh, or do you agree with it, or do you disagree with it? Uh, so I, I, will, I will answer the question, and I want to start with um, one of the words you used, which was countries are unable to provide it. That I, I disagree with. I think that many countries around the world make a lot of um, education and general resource decisions, and quite often many of the underserved populations are left out of the, both the decision-making process and receiving the resources on the back end. So I'm going to answer the question and say yes. Given the current situation, low-fee private schools do expand access. But I'm going to come back with a question of access to what? You know, I think there's a very important question about what the quality of these schools are. And then from a macro picture, it seems like low-fee private schools are, as much as they're offering in terms of uh, access to some level of education, which I think many studies have shown is not actually that great and not fundamentally different than the public education is, off, is offering, um, actually sort of lets the governments off the hook and it ends up serving a ban like a band-aid over the larger picture of a, a lack of governments to address the needs of their people. So when you look at, for instance, India, um, they have a Gini coefficient around 34, which is the, inef that's the coefficient for income inequality, which tells me that they're not the most unequal country on the planet by far, but they're also not very equal. Those resources are not distributed very well across the society, and I wouldn't expect them to be distributed well across the education sector either. So I think um, I would want to turn the lens back on the government and talk about you know, what it means to actually achieve education for all in a real way with access to high-quality education and how pursuing certain models, such as low-fee private schools, might actually be a way in which um, education resources get diverted from the places that need them most. Because low-fee private schools target the poor, but they don't target the very poor. So they end up sort of increasing um, what I like to call meso-levels of stratification. It's not just rich and poor. It's, it's a it's sort of a, um, a, a very distinct bands of, um, of, of groups of students that have differential access to education, like we saw in Chile and like uh, we also saw in the United States, particularly uh, in New Orleans with a new study that we just published. This is also the, um, the chapter that you write in, in the book is about New Orleans, and Scope just put out a whole report on uh, the New Orleans kind of reforms, educational reforms since Katrina. Um, focusing on your case study, can you give us a quick snapshot of, of what did you learn uh, by, by doing a case study of New Orleans when it comes to the origins of the germ model in New Orleans and what sort of lessons you draw and conclusions you draw after the, after studying it. Sure. 
Well, when you look at what happened in New Orleans, um, I think you can um, use... <laughs> Naomi Klein offers a, a very stark description uh, in the shock doctrine about what what happened in New Orleans in terms of um, just a, a very um, explicit uh, takeover of their education system. And actually, I did interview a school leader in New Orleans who admitted as much on tape saying, was the system stolen? Yes, it was. And by stolen, I mean that Basically, the laws, when you look at the laws that were passed in, um, in the United States and in Louisiana in particular following the storm, it was very clear that they targeted um, the New Orleans schools for uh, takeover and then um, reauthorizing them as charter schools. And so um, around over seven thousand teachers were fired without due process after New Orleans uh, had Hurricane Katrina. There are a lot of different reasons for that um, in terms of the city was, you know, underwater. It was very difficult for people to come back and return to their homes. Schools were not uh, in uh, an enough shape to be serving as uh, educational institutions for students. There, I don't, I don't want to... Um, pile blame too much anywhere, but the fact is that there was a significant shift and the storm was used as the main mechanism for that shift. Now, in our chapter, we don't focus just on New Orleans. We talk about the U.S. education system as a whole, and there have been a lot of privatization pushes in the United States over the last 30 or 40 years, and one of them came out of the federal law, uh, No Child Left Behind, which deems schools as failing and uh, which provides legislation in which if students and schools are not making adequately year process, they can be ad adequate yearly progress, they can be deemed as failing. So that gives a, a mechanism for states, which was used by Louisiana to declare a whole subset of schools, and they actually changed the bar, uh, the point system, to declare a whole subset of schools as failing. So the bottom line is, the effect of this, 10 years on, is that you have an increased level of stratification based on this charter system. Um, in the, in, you know, there was already a lot of stratification and a lot of segregation in the American South and in New Orleans in particular. We, we know this. This is well documented. And the New Orleans public school system was not doing a great job of serving students before Katrina. However, when we look at it now, we find around eight or nine different tiers of students based on um, their access to different schools of different quality. So we're replicating what happened in Chile, in New Orleans, with these sort of meso-level um, access to different um, schools with different levels of educational quality. And so you can look at the achievement scores, and it's literally a downward sloping line from um, the top tier school, schools uh, performing about almost 400 on the, um, the state test to the bottom tier schools performing about 250 uh, on a scale score for uh, math and uh, reading. So the, the, the difference is very stark. It's also racial in nature. So if you're a white student, you're much more likely to be going to um, a school in the uh, top tier of the New Orleans system. 90% of white students go there. Only 10% are distributed throughout the other tiers in the system. Um, so, and the, the, you know, the, the top tier school is one of the top performers in the states. And the bottom tier schools, one of them is run by um, an organization, a company that operates a correctional facility in another state in the United States. So you can see a very, very strong difference in who is being served at these institutions and the level of attention to their education that's being paid um, to the different students uh, along the lines of race and class in the United States. Over this 
this journey of putting this book together and working on these various case studies of of this six different countries um, or yeah, six different countries um, were there any surprises that you uncovered um, yes I would say in general uh, it was quite interesting to uh, work with the authors and uh, I learned that each country has its own story and that story exists both within a global narrative and also is uh, independent and um, part of the, the, the individual country's history. And uh, some surprises were that uh, if you take the case of Finland, it turns out that the timing of the PISA scores when they were first released at the turn of the century um, were came out at a time when the business community was really arguing for increasing uh, a privatization model. But Finland's PISA scores were so high that uh, the business community couldn't really make the claim that the Finnish education system was, was not working. So they ended up... Uh, you know, saying, well, we know we have to go with what we have, and, and the rest of the world descended on Finland to find out what was working so well. On, on the contrary, when you take a case of uh, Sweden, um, Sweden had an odd event happen in the mid-80s where uh, one of their ministers, um, Olaf Palme, was actually assassinated in 1986. And he held a lot of sway in both the national ministries and in education, and there's no concrete evidence, but it could be that there was a little bit of a power vacuum and a political power vacuum in the education sector that led to decisions being um, routed more to the uh, Ministry of Finance. And then finally, I want to highlight one uh, important surprise, which is that um, Ontario uh, had actually implemented a quasi-voucher system in Canada in the late 1990s and then in the early 2000s, uh, the province uh, reversed course, actually. Uh, the conservatives were voted out, the voucher system was rolled back, and uh, a whole system reform model was instituted uh, with the, the teacher unions are at the table, with the policymakers, and they've seen quite a bit of improvement uh, on their scores and other indicators. And I, I just like to highlight that because it really is a, a, a sign of uh, democracy at work where, you know, the sort of forces of privatization and the markets are not necessarily um, over the long term the ones that, the, that serve the public, uh, as our book would suggest. And the public actually uh, can and does have a say in their education system. Thank you so much for joining Fresh Ed today and uh, for its inaugural show, by the way. Um, and we look forward to reading the book when it comes out in March 2016. Great, Will. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm happy to be the inaugural speaker on uh, Fresh Ed. And uh, please uh, look for the book when it comes out. Thank you. Frank Adamson is co-editor of a new volume called Global Education Reform due out in March 2016. Next week, I'll speak with Professor Chris Lubienski about the role think tanks play in education policymaking. Fresh Ed is brought to you by the Globalization and Education Special Interest Group of the Comparative and International Education Society. If you want to highlight your research on Fresh Ed, please send an email to gesig.cies at gmail.com. Again, that is G-E-S-I-G dot C-I-E-S at gmail dot com.